The following message was recorded at the Malaga Assembly of God on Sunday, June 21st, 2015. Here is Pastor Randy Sabella. Happy Father's Day. But we're going to talk today uh, to all of the men and women and children and everyone that's here about walking with God. Because no matter what our title or situation is, it's important that we learn to walk with God. Do you remember when your children took their first steps? I mean, that's one of the big, the big things. And usually they, you, you lay them on their back and, and they play and then they, they, they roll over. And it's like, oh, look, they, they rolled over, they rolled over, and it's so exciting. And then they, they get up and they, they start crawling, right? And then from there, I'm sure there's other stages, I don't know, but, but and then you, you hold them up and then you let go, but not too far, right? And so they're learning to get on, on their legs and they're, they're, they're a little, little wobbly. And then you, 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 you put them here and you have them walk towards the other parent or, or someone else. But you're pretty close together so nothing terrible can happen. And they, they take a wobbly step and then, and then just, you know, maybe fall or maybe they get there. And then, then before you know it, they start walking. And then you say, would you please slow down? And then you want them to talk, right? And they learn a couple words and they learn ball. No, dad. Dada. Ball. No, dad. And then they learn to talk, and then it's like, wow, would you please, you know? <laughs> but learning to walk is so exciting for the whole, the whole family. And for some kids, they pick up very quickly. For other kids, it's through stumbles and falls, but they learn to walk. Do you know our walk with the Lord involves a lot of that? Uh, at the beginning stages, when we first accept Christ as our Savior, our walk isn't as strong as maybe it is now. And thank God, if you have a strong walk with the Lord, don't apologize for that. Thank God for that. But you know, there's different stages where we're just learning to walk with the Lord. So I'm going to talk today about walking with the Lord, and it, it's going to be for those that are just starting to walk with the Lord and those that have walked with the Lord for a long time. And we're going to look at the life of Noah going to look at the life of Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. It says, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, and say, say one, one, go ahead, you say it with me, one, one. He was a righteous man. He was blameless among the people, two, two. And he walked with God three. See, my math skills aren't that bad. I got all the way to three. But that's going to be the three-point sermon today. So you can follow along with that. Those are going to be the three points of the sermon. Noah was a righteous man, one. He was blameless among the people, two. And he walked with God three. And so we're just going to unpack those three thoughts, beginning with he was a righteous man. Being made righteous comes, watch, before living righteously. This is huge. Being made righteous comes before living righteously. That we don't uh, earn our way into salvation. We don't live so righteously that all of a sudden God accepts us. There's no amount of good things we can do that we get to a certain point and we think, wow, I've reached this point, God will accept me, and now I'm saved because I've done so much good. That's not what Christianity is all about. Religion says that if you live right, then maybe God will accept you. Other religions say that if you do these certain things, then maybe God will accept you. But Christianity is completely different in that, in that the only work that needed to be done was by Jesus Christ, and he did that work on the cross. And then, now watch how this worked. He lived a righteous life. He lived a perfect life. Then when he died on the cross, he took sin. And then when we accept his salvation by faith, he takes his righteousness and gives it to us. So it's in essence, if we could put it this way, he's wearing a white robe signifying his purity. I come to him broken 
As one of the songs uh, we sang today, broken and sinful, my heart was dark with sin. Okay? But when we accept Christ and we look out to him, he takes that righteous robe and he places it on us. And so we become righteous not through the right things that we've done, but through what Jesus has done. And we call that amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. This idea of grace and, and salvation being given to us from God in that it's God's work and not our work, goes all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible. I've narrowed down my favorite scripture verse uh, to Genesis 3, 9. Now that's a big deal because I've been studying the Word of God seriously for about 30 years, and I have a lot of favorite scriptures, but I've always thought, what's that one scripture that would summarize everything that I believe about God? And that scripture is found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, but number 9 is the key. And it says this, then th this is Adam and Eve, they had sinned, they yielded to temptation, okay? Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. You see, that's religion. Religion says, if I do the right things, then I can cover my own sin. But that didn't work, did it? It didn't restore relationship to God. Because that relationship with God in the garden was broken because of their sin. Verse 8 says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Here's my favorite verse. But the Lord God called to the man. Where are you? The Lord God called. Why is that your favorite verse? Out of however many thousands of verses in the Bible, Pastor, why is that your favorite verse? Here's why. is because God pursues us because he knows that I could never get to him. That he knows that no matter how much I try to fix myself up, no matter how much I try to cover my sin and shame, there's nothing I could do. Do you know that at the Garden of Eden, God could have just said, you sinned, you blew it, I'm done with you. But he didn't do that, did he? He was walking in the garden as he always did. They hid from him because they knew that there was something broken in that relationship because of sin. They tried to cover themselves by doing the right thing, but that wasn't enough. But God called out to them. The only reason that we're here today, the only reason we can have hope and assurance that someday we'll be reunited with our loved ones through Jesus Christ is because God called out to man in the Garden of Eden. The only reason that we can have assurance of salvation is that God has called out to us. And so then what did God do? They couldn't cover themselves. And so he sacrificed an animal and then gave them skins to cover them. That's in verse 21. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and he clothed them. See, from the very beginning of scripture and the beginning of time, sacrifice, a blood sacrifice was always involved in a right relationship with God when it had been broken. At some point in our lives, all of our relationship with God was broken. I grew up in church, but I didn't have a relationship with the Lord until I accepted Him as my Lord and Savior. I knew the Sunday school answers, but I didn't have a relationship with God. And so we love to say here, whether you grew up in the sanctuary or you grew up on the streets, we all end up at the cross. We all end up coming to Jesus and saying, forgive me. My sins might have been different than those that grew up on the street, but my sin still separated me from God. And so I needed someone to save me, and that name is, is Jesus. And he sacrificed himself. And so the idea of being right with God or righteousness goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God established the pattern. Man would sin. God would pursue God would provide the sacrifice. Man just accepts what God has already done for them. That's salvation. 
all the way in the book of Genesis. So when we see that Noah was a righteous man, it doesn't mean that he was such a good man that he was, salvation was assured. What it means is that he had received the righteousness of God. And so watch in verse 8. Now I read verse 9 with those three points, but the verse right before that says this. In the NIV it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The King James Version says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's verse 8. Before we get to verse 9, the reason that Noah could walk righteously. The reason that he could be a man of integrity, I'm going to get to that, that's what blameless means. The reason he could walk with God was because of the grace of God. And so I want you to know men, women, children, uh, those listening online, those in the cafe, I want you to know that it's not about getting yourself all put together so that God would accept you. It's about receiving the free gift of salvation that he gives to you because he died on the cross for your sins. Let me review. Religion says cover yourself up, which is impossible. Relationship says God pursues us. Christianity says God has pursued us. We're not saved because we're good. We're saved because he's good. And that never changes. That's the good news of the gospel. And so God pursued. God looked and he gave grace to Noah. And walking with God, which is our main theme of today, begins with God's invitation to you. Will you believe that Jesus is the only Savior? Do you know why I believe that Jesus is the only Savior? Because the Bible says that Jesus is the only Savior. I'm not narrow in my thinking. The Bible is exclusive in its teaching. It says that there is no other name by which man should be saved. It says, and we sang so appropriately this morning, he is the truth, he is the way, he is the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. Again, we're not narrow in our thinking. God is exclusive in his teaching in that there is not many ways to get to God. If there were many ways to get to God, then Jesus would not have had to die on the cross. There's one way to God, but that way is for everyone. You see, it's exclusive in his teaching that Jesus is the way, but it doesn't rule out anyone. That's why, as we said, the church is not black or white or Asian or Hispanic or whatever. The church is the church of Jesus Christ because we all come through the same way. If anything, the church is is red because we've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's all it is. And so have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? You cannot walk with God as we would talk about if you've not taken that first step. You can't be a marathon runner if you've never taken the, the first step. And sometimes that first step is the hardest. But some of you you, you, you grew up outside of the church and you didn't take that step until you were a full-fledged adult in life. Some of you I know were, were almost 50 years old when you accepted Christ. And now you look back on life and say, wow, my only regret is that I would have accepted him sooner. That's the only regret. See, that first step sometimes is the hardest, but it's the most important. And you know, if you're going to walk with God, the first step of salvation is the most important. And you know what? Just like a little child will fall down, we make mistakes and we fall down too. But isn't it great that the parents just pick the child up and set him on his way again, wipe the tears, straighten their clothes? Isn't it great that we have a heavenly father that doesn't condemn us because we fall? He picks us up because he loves us. Noah was righteous. We have to be righteous through Jesus Christ in order to walk with God. Now, this is important. You can believe that Jesus is the only Savior, but are you willing to repent of your sins and turn around? Are you willing to accept what he's done, but also to stop doing what you want to do and start living for him? This is a little shocking, but it's so true, and I've used this example before. If belief that Jesus was the Son of God was the only answer, then the devil would be saved, right? There is no one more orthodox in their belief than Satan. 
Satan believes Jesus is the son of God. Satan believes that Jesus was the creator of everything. Satan believes that Jesus came to earth, was born of a virgin. Satan believes that Jesus did miracles. Satan believes that Jesus died on the cross. Satan believes that Jesus rose again. Satan believes that he ascended to the right hand of the Father. Satan believes all that. Is he saved? No, because he refuses to bend his will to the will of God. He holds on to that pride. See, it's not just proper belief. Is it faith and repentance or faith or repentance? It's the same coin, different sides. True saving faith involves repentance. I'm sorry for what I've done. I don't want to live like that anymore. God, would you help me? To live for you would you help me to walk with you and every person that asks that God will receive and welcome watch into his family into his family I'm gonna to touch on this in just a couple of minutes but watch he takes us from death to life he doesn't welcome us as servants in the lower part of the house let's say he welcomes us as family and joint heirs with Jesus Glory to his name. How do we walk with God? First, you have to take that very first step of faith. Jesus is the only Savior. Faith and repentance. I know that I've tried to cover up my own sins. I know that I've tried to do my own thing, but it's not working. I know I need a Savior. Jesus, will you save me? And he will. That's the first step. But it's not the last step. Some have never taken the first step. Some have never taken another step. That they can look back on their life and say that, yeah, I accepted Christ when I was a child. I accepted Christ at VBS or at, in my day it was Kids Crusade, if you remember that. But have never taken another step. And so that's not walking with God either. Oh, I took a step when I was a kid, but then I just sat down. Or then I just lived however I wanted to live. That's not walking with God either. Because the first step needs to lead to a second step. And then the next step leads to another step and walking with God. So now that Noah had received the grace of God and was made righteous, how did he live? It says he lived a blameless life, but I'm going to explain that. Because the first thought is, wait a second, Noah was perfect? No, no one was perfect other than Jesus. So it can't mean perfect. What does blameless mean? And here's t technically and literally what the Hebrew word means. It means wholeness. Here's how we'll phrase it. He was a man of integrity. As he was on Sunday morning, he was on Saturday night. As he lived during the week, he lived for God. He was a man of integrity. He wasn't a man that lived one way in front of people and then another way in front of another group of people. He was a man of integrity or wholeness. He was blameless among the people in that he never uh, rejected the things of God but held on to the things of God. He was blameless in a wicked and horrible day. The day was so bad that the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Can you, can you imagine? That the whole human race, the only thoughts were evil all of the time. And so the Lord regretted that he had made human beings, and I'll add this, in the first place. That's how bad it was, and yet we have a light shining in the darkness, and his name is Noah, because he received the grace of God and now lived for God as a man of integrity. Listen, I don't know that every human being uh, only thinks evil. I don't believe that. I'm not so pessimistic to believe that, you know, uh, the world is such a mess that Jesus can't heal it, but I do believe that the world is a mess and I do believe that there's evil and wickedness all around us and the things that we're seeing in public now are things that would never even be discussed in private the things that are being glorified and lifted up as good the Bible calls evil but the Bible also says that there's coming a time where what is good is, is bad and what is bad is now good. We're living in those days. But that's not an excuse for the men of God. Because it wasn't an excuse in Noah's day. 
See, for those of us that want to live for God and walk with God on a daily basis, we can't look at the world that's evil and say, it's just too hard to live for Jesus. Noah did it. And his times were so evil that God regretted ever creating human beings. His times were so wicked that God sent an earth-wide flood to destroy everyone except Noah and his family. That the world was so evil and so wicked that it had to be destroyed and started over again. That's how bad it was. And yet in the midst of the darkness, there was a shining light, a man of God that received the grace of God and lived in integrity before God and before man. He wasn't perfect, but he was real. He wasn't perfect, but he was real. And that's all God requires of us, to be real. Being a strong Christian or being a spiritual person doesn't mean presenting this image that nothing ever bothers you and that everything is always fine and that you never have any problems and if you just say the right things and do the right things, everything's great and all that. No, I think being a real spiritual person is being real. And we can go to Jesus. God, if there's any other way, then take this cup from me. That's real. Paul was so frightened at different points of his life that Jesus himself, if you flip through the book of Acts and have red letter, you'll see that in the middle of the book of Acts, there's red letters, meaning Jesus himself had to come back to Paul and tell him, don't be afraid. That's real. The disciples, they, they lived with fear. They were being persecuted and murdered and martyred. That's real. It's okay to be real and walk with God. In fact, you're better off being real and walking, watch, and talking with God about your realness. God, I'm struggling in this area. I don't have to tell you, but I just, you know, you know, I need your help. That's being real. And that's being a real believer and a real Christian. Noah wasn't blameless. He was real. He was a man of integrity. And third, he walked with God. He walked with God. He had an ongoing, personal, and close relationship with God. He was a man of faith. We know that to be true. God came to him, spoke to him, and said, Noah, I want you to build an ark because it's going to rain. And Noah said, um, ark? Um, rain? But he was a man of faith and said, you know what? If God's word says it, then I'm going to believe it whether I understand it or not. If God's word, word says it, I'm going to obey just because he said it whether I can see the immediate results or not. So not only was he a man of faith, but he was also a man of faithfulness. The ark took I used to think it was 120 years, but it was probably from the time he told Noah to the time the flood came, that was 120 years. But in between that 120 years, he had children and everything, which I'll explain to you. Uh, some of the scholars that I read, they're, they're thinking the ark took 70, 80, 90 years. That's a long time. I don't care how long it is. And sometimes we want answers in seven days. God, I've been living for you. I've been serving you for all of these years. It's been now seven days. I don't know how much longer I can hold on to my faith in you. It's been seven days. If you were really God, then in seven days you would have answered my prayer. Because don't you see I've served you all of these years? In seven days. But Noah, being a man of faith and faithfulness, even though it took decades, he kept going with no rain in sight. The only thing he could see was the ark. The only thing he could hear was the people making fun of him. And yet he kept going. Next. And last. He was a godly father. Here's why. Because he brought his children to the ark. You know, dads, the greatest gift that you can bring your children is to bring them to church. And 
don't, nobody here has done this because you're obviously here, but you don't have to just drop them off and run away in fear. Um, I'm thankful for parents, and some on, on Wednesday nights in particular, they bring their children, they drop them off, and then they, they leave. And I'm thankful that they have enough faith in the church and the, the leaders and everything that they feel comfortable to bring their children. But oh, how my heart breaks for those that if they would only just know that the church is safe for them too. That it's okay. You know, some of the th events and things that we do as a church, the, the, the reason for them is just to break down some barriers. Because you don't know what people think. You don't know what people think about Pentecostal churches. If, if they only watch the History Channel and, and these other things, you know, they might think that while we're here, you know, we're pulling out snakes or we're climbing up and down the walls and screaming and yelling. And, you know, even in some Pentecostal circles, there was a day where people said they had demons and so they would throw up in paper bags. And so they would hand out paper bags. At the I don't know about all that. That's a little weird. And I grew up in Pentecostalism. And I've seen some weird stuff. That's a little weird for me. But you don't know what people are thinking. But if we can invite them in and let them know the love of God and not the lunacy of God's people, <laughs> there might be a breakthrough in some of their lives. But to the dads, thank you for bringing your children to church and getting them on the ark. Because the world will destroy them. And that's a fact and that's not a joke. Thank you to the grandfathers that have taken it upon themselves to bring their, and, and grandmothers too, obviously, to bring their grandchildren to church and getting them on the ark because the world will destroy them. Noah was a godly father in the fact that his children first, no one else believed that the rain was coming, but his children did. And I'll ask you why, and I think the answer is because he received the grace of God, he lived a life of integrity, and he walked with God on a daily basis. Does that guarantee that our children will get on the ark? No, it doesn't. But it sure gives a lot better opportunity than someone that wants to live their own rebellious way and then all of a sudden to think that their children won't live rebelliously. To walk with God... It's three points. A lot of words for three points, huh? Some of you are thinking that now. Wow, I thought it was only three points. He's been going for a long time. Receive grace. That's the first step. There's no, second, there's no other step until you receive God's grace, but he'll welcome you. Live for him as a person that's real and walk with him. And then I'll add this as point A to number three. Bring your children with you. Bring them along. My dad never lectured us about the things of God. Never once do I remember him lecturing us. And he was a phenomenal teacher of God's word. Phenomenal teacher. But I never remember at dinner time that he would, you know, get a book and a chart and uh, notes. You know what my dad did? He lived it. And his life was so strong, we just couldn't help but follow him <laughs> on the ark. Now I know that not all of our children that are represented here and all of our grandchildren are serving God. I, I know that. I'm praying for my children every day that they stay on track, that they never look to the right or to the left. But I'm just saying I, I can look back and know that I've given my children every opportunity to live the right way. That's all. That's all we can ask for. How do we do this? We repent of our sins and ask Jesus to forgive us. We let him help us uh, to live a life of integrity, to be real, not perfect, and we walk daily with him. How do we walk daily with him? We walk daily with him by praying, reading the Bible, and going to church. It's the same as the answers in Sunday school. There's really no other greater, higher point to following Jesus. Pray, read your Bible, go to church, tell others. I mean, that's, that's what it boils down to. That's what it boils down to. All of these years later, I still know the Sunday school answers. It's pray, read the Bible, and, and go to church. 
There's a lot of hope in that. There's a lot of answers in that. There's a lot of dedication. There's a lot of faithfulness involved in doing those things. There's a lot of saying no to other things in order to say yes to this. Pastor, I don't have time to read the Bible. Then you're busier than God ever intended you to be. I don't have time to pray. Then you're busier than God ever intended you to be. I don't have time to go to church. Then you're busier than God ever intended you to be. And very simply put, because we're running out of time, I don't have time to beat around the bush, you've decided to answer to someone else other than to answer to God. You've decided to answer to your children. You've decided to answer to your family. You've decided to answer to your boss. You've decided to answer to your team. You've decided to answer to someone other than to God. Because God has given you enough time to pray, to read the Bible, and to go to church because that's his purpose and that's his plan for your life. We want to help all of the men of this church. I have a burden for the men of the church because I know we live in wicked times. I know we live in difficult times. I want you to know that your church and your pastor is behind you a thousand percent and we don't expect you to be perfect because I'm not perfect. I'm far from it. I was talking with my friends around the table this morning, telling them some of my high school stories, none of which I will repeat uh, today to be recorded forever. But, you know, nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. We're not asking you to be that. We want you to be real. But we want to give you the tools that can help you to walk for Jesus. And so we get things in the mail all of the time at the office. And all kind of things they want you to buy and do this and programs and campaigns and everything. But for some reason this year, this little booklet caught my eye. And it's entitled this, and I think it's why, because man of God walking by faith. And this is the picture, and I, I just love the idea of, of working, but with the Bible at the center. I love the idea of, of, of dirty boots, worn in boots meaning they've been worn for a long time doing a lot of work over a long period of time, but in the center of it all is, is God's Word. And so this booklet that we're going to give to all of the men that are here today is entitled that, Man of God Walking by Faith. It's a daily devotional. Okay, It's a small book. This, if you can see it, I don't know how well you can see it, is just one day. That's all. Five minutes, seven minutes, that's all. The beginning of it is a scripture verse. That you don't have to look up, it's right there for you. You read a little bit about what it means, like this one on day four is a legacy of solid ground on solid ground. You read a little bit, and then there's a little prayer at the end. Holy Spirit, teach me how to walk by faith. That's all. But I'm going to make a guarantee to all of the men, if you would do this consistently for one month, God will change your life. Now hear me, I'm not saying he's going to change all of your circumstances, because I can't guarantee that. But I can say that if you will do this consistently for the next month with the other men in the church, both campuses, every man that calls this church their church home, if you will do it consistently for the next month, God will change you. And you will be different at the end of the month than you are right now. And so I'm looking forward to it. We created a Facebook page, if you know what that is. Uh, to share together, to offer insights to each other, to encourage uh, other men. It's only for men. No women. Come up with your own Facebook page. Okay? But it's for the men of the church. If you don't know how to do it and would like to, let me know. I'll, I'll help you with it or ask your kids, your grandkids, they know how to do it, uh, to be a part of it. I'm going to be preaching for the next few weeks on walking with God. The next ser sermon next week is walking with God together, meaning we need each other too. We need God, but we need each other to help us. Uh, and so we're going to look at that. And so what I want to do at this time, I'm going to close this, this part of the sermon and just say, be a man of God. Accept his forgiveness. Be real. Be real. And walk with him on a consistent basis. And God will change your life. And he will touch you and use you to affect generations long after you. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 You've been listening to Randy Sabella, pastor of the Malaga Assembly of God Church in Malaga, New Jersey. 
For more information about the Malaga Assembly of God, go to our website, www.malagaag.com. That's www.malagaag.com.